This is um, the last point that was raised was actually a good um, way into my talk because I was thinking that if people are modified, you know, if there's a lot of um, work going on in genetic, uh, in gene editing and so on, um, what does closer to the mic? Actually, it's a challenge for you. Never mind. The mic is. Oh, okay. Um, if there's a lot of modification going on of humans, what does that say about us as humans? Are we humans? Are we natural? Are we artifacts? If we are artifacts, does that mean then that we lose certain rights and so on? I mean, certain artifacts will, might, may have rights. If we're artifacts, does that mean that we have the same sort of rights as a table that we make if we're made by somebody else? Anyway, that's um, not the main thrust of my talk, but I'll probably get on, to, oh, well, I will get on to some issues like that um, short in a little while. An overview, just so you have an idea of why I want to, why I'm talking about this. A common claim, actually there's two common claims, but they came under, come under the same heading for me. Um, some things shouldn't be done because they're playing God or interfering with nature. Some things uh, are just in the realm of God or in the realm of nature and we shouldn't um, get into that realm. Uh, my claim is that there's nothing wrong in itself with playing God or interfering with nature, but that needs to be um, qualified quite a lot. We have to be wary, though, um, because it can be very dangerous and more dangerous than um, a lot of other things, I think, if we do get into this area where um, people might claim they're playing God or interfering with nature. Right, so that's why I want to talk about it. It seems to me to be an interesting question anyway. And the context where it arises most commonly is in scientific research and technological development. Questions like, should we allow human enhancement, genetic modification of organisms, creation of new organisms, geoengineering? and so on. These are the main areas where it's been raised in recent times. And just um, on the human enhancement one, something that isn't talked about very much, but I will mention again later, is disenhancement. If we can enhance people, if we have the technology to enhance people, we've got the technology to disenhance people for various reasons. And in the animal realm, there's um, a problem that's called the blind chicken problem and that is modifying chickens so that they can't see in which case they'll be happier to live together in fairly nasty conditions so might we want to do that with people if we get too many and if the environment gets too bad and so on so human disenhancement is the other side of human enhancement the one that um, we don't talk about much that's for good reason. Now I need to, I'll, I'll apologise about this in a minute, but my talk's very much from a Western perspective. Um, and there's a well-known novel that was written a long time ago called, um, I think it might just be called Frankenstein. Um, and Frankenstein's monster was um, a person or a human created by Frankenstein that became a monster and then it did all sorts of nasty things. And when people are talking about genetic engineering and um, even GMOs and all sorts of things like that, they'll often talk about, uh, they'll bring up the notion of Frankenstein which is a very popular or well-known uh, example and novel in um, in English, and I'll get back to Frankenstein 
later. Now, some recent examples of people who have talked about playing God. When he talked about playing God in the sense not that they were playing God, but that they thought he shouldn't. Um, oh, sorry, before I get on to that. Yeah, this example that we've been discussing quite a lot. Um, Seti and Elder Virginia <coughs> a pair of twins while they were embryos. Um, and as um, was said, we'll probably hear more about this example later, and I'll get back to it before. Um, a second Chinese woman is pregnant with a gene-edited baby, so the press reports came out a few days ago, and is being medically supervised by local authorities. Now I'll get back to these examples, and the other one that was mentioned before that wasn't on, that I don't have here, is the... Um, one about the monkeys that were cloned in order to, um, uh, yeah, to find out sort of what's going on with with um, people's sleep patterns and so on. And I think one of the main objections there was that these cloned monkeys all um, were actually suffering. They weren't healthier than normal ones. They were actually less healthy. Okay, some clarification. <coughs> this is a Western perspective, simply because I couldn't talk with any authority <coughs> from any other. Um, but what would be interesting would be to, and perhaps this can come out in discussion, look more carefully at what some of the consequences might be um, of the kind of view I'm putting forward if you look at it from um, some other perspective a Buddhist or a um, Jewish or a Muslim or Hindu or something. Now, I'm making a fairly big claim here too that in the West, in Christianity anyway, um, it can be argued that there's a big distinction made between God and nature and humans. Like they're all separate. Now there are, that can be qualified in various ways, but in general I think that's true. And one of the reasons that makes me think it's true is that I've been doing a lot of reading in recent times on um, indigenous people in Australia and their beliefs, and they didn't draw any, dis well I suppose they had some basic ones, but basically everything was one, humans, could be related to trees and rocks and so on and all of these things had spirits. There was no sharp distinction. Your kinship it wasn't only kinship with other people, it also could be kinship with places, kinship with various animals, birds and things. So if you look at it compared with at the Western view compared with certain other views and certainly the indigenous ones in Australia, um, this uh, point about nature, humans, and God all being distinct uh, doesn't seem very far out. Now, that some of you may know is our famous Prince Charles, who in 1998, he's a bit of a greenie, Prince Charles, <coughs> Prince of Wales, said that scientists researching transgenic crops were entering realms that belong to God and God alone. Right? And that was a very clear statement about playing God. If we genetically modify crops, we're playing God because God didn't intend us to do that. Um, that's in his realm. Clive Hamilton is um, an Australian writer wrote a book a little while ago called Earth Masters um, and the subtitle of this book is Playing God with the Climate and in this book Clive is talking about geoengineering that is modifying various aspects of the earth um, to get rid of global warming talking about things like you know putting all sorts of particles in the air so that or even mirrors so that the sun's rays are um, diverted before they get here or some of them and so on and Clive Hamilton 
was arguing that what we're doing is playing God. In that case, he says it's a bit similar to Prince Charles. Playing God <coughs> entails humans crossing a boundary or a domain of control or causation that is beyond their rightful place. And he goes on, to cross successfully would require mortals to possess a degree of omniscience and omnipotence that has always been preserved for God or the great processes of nature that are rightfully beyond human interference. So here he's sort of making this link between playing God and interfering with nature, which I want to talk about um, in a bit more detail as well. And I also want to get back in a little while to this idea of crossing boundaries because I think that's where the real force of playing God or um, interfering with nature comes in. And there have been a few good examples of that in the discussion um, this morning. And if if I'd had another half day to work on this talk with knowing what I had heard this morning, I probably would have changed my talk a little bit. Okay, now, playing God, there are two versions, at least, um, that's what I want to claim. There's a religious one and a secular one. Char uh, Charles, um, what's his name? <laughs> Prince Charles. Um, very much um, put up the um, religious one. We're playing God. We're doing what only the Creator should be able to do, what only God should be able to do. But there's also a secular version, and that is the version that we shouldn't do what... Um, or we shouldn't interfere with nature. We shouldn't do what's in the realm of nature. Now, Prince Charles certainly isn't, isn't the only one, I think, to talk about playing God in, in this religious aspect, I think um, there are underlying thoughts in certain Christian religions where there are certain things you shouldn't do, like birth control and euthanasia and so on, because you should die when God wants you to die, not when you want to die or other people want you to die. Now, it's not clear, of course, how that fits in with using medicines at all, but that's a different issue. Now, the religious version, doing what only God should do, or not respecting the sacred. Now, as I said, this is very much um, from a Christian point of view, although I imagine any um, at least any monotheistic religion would have similar ways of, of looking at this. <coughs> Prince Charles entering realms that belong to God and God alone. But even in the Christian traditions, I'm not a theologian, but that, that there are at least two ways of interpreting this. If you look in, um, in Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament, there are two views, really, of um, people's relationship with the world. One is, God said, have dominion over it. Go and populate it, have dominion over it. Um, you are the boss, as it were. And the other one is that, um, you know, you are stewards. God said, you are stewards of what I've made, and so on. So the stewardship and dominion views are both different, um, or place different emphasis anyway, um, on, um, on what the relationship might be and what we can do. But I'm not, as I said, I'm not a theologian, I'm not going to get into what the um, right uh, religious interpretation of playing God should be, because, um, well, for a couple of reasons. One, there are different concepts of God. Um, it's not clear what should be left to God anyway, and that came up, I think, um, in the discussion or in the talk, um, the last one before lunch. 
it's not clear what should be left to God, and the best it only works with religious people. So a lot of people, if you talk about playing God, will not take any notice of what you're talking about because they are not religious. So I'm not saying there's no force in it. Um, all I'm saying is that it has problems and it's not where I'm going to spend most of my time today because I think the thrust of the argument, whether it's a religious or secular, is the same. Now in the secular version, nature replaces God. We shouldn't interfere with nature. We we've of, we've often um, hear people talk about that, the genetic modification of food um, is talked about in those terms quite often as well. Um, why shouldn't we interfere with nature? It's doing what isn't natural, or it's doing something against nature. It's disrespectful of nature. Okay, well these are claims that, that are often made. But that raises an interesting question about what is nature and what is natural. This is one of the reasons this question interests me now is that now that I've retired I live up in the mountains where hardly any people live. But it's also an area where there is a very big hydroelectric scheme. So we've got thousands of hectares of nothing except forest. And we've got, um, in amongst that, we've got some very advanced technology. So wandering around in the mountains, sometimes seeing all these technological artefacts and other times seeing only birds and kangaroos and things so they get you wondering about what is nature and how it's differentiated from technology and whatnot. But anyway that's by the way. Um, what is nature here because there's two views here at, well there's actually a continuum but two sort of main views. One is that humans are part of nature, everything is part of nature and the other one is that we're in some way beyond nature. That nature's there, we're here. And that's the sense we use if we say we like being out in nature. Because if we, if we are part of nature and say we want to be out in nature, we might as well walk down the middle of Bangkok. Right? Because that's just as much nature as a forest is if we are part of nature. At least that's what I want to argue in a minute. Actually, this is getting back to Darwin's book. Well, Darwin is one of multiple authors. The quote in there is, oh, there's a lot of quotes, but one is, humans are part of nature and must learn how to behave toward one another and interact with the environment. Now, I don't think any of that's false, but, and certainly not the second part, but if we are part of nature, we have to be fairly careful about how we talk about nature. And the reason I want to say that is, well, for one reason, playing God, I think, makes little sense. If we are part of nature, everything that we do is natural. So there's no point in saying you shouldn't do that. It's unnatural. Because if we are part of nature, it's natural. It's just what humans do. Humans are part of nature, so all human activities are natural in that sense. Birds build nests, we build houses. If we were a bird, we'd probably say, oh, look, when we're flying around looking at Bangkok, we'd say, oh, that's beautiful nature created by these people. Whereas, given that we aren't birds, I mean, well, birds might say that, I don't know. But from our perspective, we say, oh, look, that's a lovely bird's nest. But for a bird, presumably, if they think about it at all, a nest is an artifact, the same as a house is to us. So if we're talking about um, nature, we have to be fairly clear on, on what we mean. Rabbits dig burrows, humans build roads and cities. 
birds, rabbits, humans all change nature in a sense. Even though when we look at a bird's nest, we don't think that's changing nature, we think that's part of nature because birds are part of nature. If we're part of nature, we should look at Melbourne and Bangkok and so on in the same light. Right, so where does that get us? We look at um, nature, the natural and the artificial. Are we part of nature? We have conflicting intuitions on this, I think. Well, I do. Um, but I think basically, and I don't know what the situation is in other languages, but certain, I mean, in, in indigenous languages in Australia, this distinction would have made no sense. But in English, it does. We have, we use, we have different senses of nature. Sometimes nature excludes people. Like, I want to go for, I want to be out in nature. It means usually I want to be out in trees and forests and garden, something like that. doesn't mean I want to be walking down the middle of uh, Bangkok or somewhere. Sometimes nature includes people because we're all, we're not really very different from um, mammals. I was going to say marsupials, but we are fairly different from marsupials. Um, but we are very close to lots of other natural creatures. I spend quite a lot of time sitting on my on the back veranda of my house watching birds, cockatoos, which are fairly big. And the way they behave like people is often quite... Um, well, it, it's surprising. You think birds just do silly things, but they behave very much like people in lots of ways. I mean, they make mistakes. You can see they come into the land, they miss the branch, or they get the branch and fall over and have to do all sorts of things. They feed their young. The young get um, make a noise if they don't get fed. There are a whole lot of things, so we can see that there's a sense in which we're clearly part of nature as well. Um, the nature artificial distinction. Um, I think a better way of looking at it in terms of if you want to find um, sort of some criteria for <coughs> what actions are justifiable and perhaps which are a bit dodgy is not so much to look at the nature artificial <coughs> distinction or nature artifact distinction, but the distinction between what's dependent on humans and what's independent of humans. Playing God, it seems to me, or interfering with nature, the real core of what that is getting at is that we're expanding the, the domain of what's human dependent. We're moving the boundaries or the parameters. Um, there was one example that was brought up this morning. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, it came up, I think, in one of either what Darrell said or one of his questions, and also the um, talk on, on gene editing. Uh, if you. <coughs> if a parent um, gets some gene editing done on an embryo and then they have no child, this this would be mainly, I guess, if it was done with the um, not so much writing a deficiency, fixing up a deficiency, but trying to make it um, to give it certain abilities, perhaps that it wouldn't have otherwise, or perhaps making a mistake so that it grows up and it's sick in a way that it wouldn't have been if the gene editing hadn't done, hadn't been done. Now that's expanding the human sphere of influence. It's expanding where our um, where our boundaries are. And not only does the question came up then, well, you know, if the kid is 
has some problem who pays for it. There's also the other issue of responsibility. Suppose a child grows up, knows that its parents got a doctor or somebody to do this gene editing, it didn't go right, they've got somebody to blame, right? They can't say, well, it's an act of God or it's just the luck of the draw in the same way that they could if the parent and the doctor hadn't done it. So what it does, it means that people are responsible for actions that they would never have been responsible for before. And I think at this stage in our development, in our evolution, in our scientific knowledge, we don't really know yet how to cope with questions like that. We might one day, but I don't think we do yet. I want to say a bit more about that um, shortly. Risks, the idea of or the question about risks came up too earlier on. Some risks, we know what they are and we know what to do about them. Right? We, um, some risks can be calculated fairly clearly. We know what the probability is of, uh, well, say, uh, smoking and lung cancer. We don't know exactly, and it all depends on people's predispositions. But we know that if we smoke, the chances of getting lung cancer are higher on average. We know what some risks are, we know um, what to do about them. In the case of smoking, we stop smoking. <coughs> if taking drugs, we stop taking drugs. But there are other risks that we don't know what they are and we don't know what to, to do about them. And I think that that's where some of these issues come up in, in issues like um, genetic modification, gene editing, and so on. We might know what some of the risks are, but we might not know, um, we don't know what all the risks are, we don't know how far into the future um, the risks might arise, and if they do, we're not actually quite sure what we should do about them. We don't know who should take responsibility, we don't know who's liable, we don't know who should pay. Um, and what do we what do we tell our our son or daughter if he or she's suffering and we say, look, we're sorry, we got the doctor to modify you a bit, we hoped it would make you better, but in fact it made you worse. I mean it's not the sort of thing anybody wants to actually say to their kids, I presume. Okay, now this idea of boundaries I was talking about where I think the core of playing God or anything with nature means we're crossing boundaries that um, haven't been crossed before. And these are just some of the people who have talk, talked about this. They've developed um, Nussbaum, Cody and Wolf and shifting boundaries. Um, Jonas, um, a young, um, what his first name, a European a German philosopher from, um, I don't know, up to the uh, 60s, 70s, up to before, um, he said we might in these new areas, we don't have any parameters, we don't have standards, we don't actually know what we're doing. Dworkin, who is a fairly well-known philosopher, talked about shifting boundaries, he said that crucial boundary between choice and chance is the spine of our ethics and our morality. And any serious shift in that boundary is seriously dislocating. Um, there was a good example in Australia a few years ago, I didn't have anything to do with chimney. It had to do with building a big dam for flood mitigation in Brisbane. Right, and, and when people got flooded, when there were catastrophes because of the flood, in the past that was always legally called an act of God. But right, okay, bad luck, there's nothing much you can do about it, it's just the luck of the draw. Once that big dam was built for flood mitigation, and they had more rain than they could actually cope with, and that opened the floodgates on the dam, 
then the people who opened the floodgates on the dam got sued because they said, well, people said, well, it's your fault, you should have kept the dam all shut. Or you should have let water out a lot earlier. But of course, I didn't know how much it was going to rain. Um, and if they'd let too much water out to where then it hadn't rained and Brisbane had run out of water, then they would have been in trouble anyway. This is just, it's a fairly straightforward example, but it's a good example, I think, to show how when we start doing things, doing certain things, we don't really know um, what, our, what the standards are anymore because we're moving from something that was chance to something where we make a choice. And if we can make a choice, then of course there's moral responsibility. And we have to be very careful in what choices we make. <coughs> Jonas said all previous ethics had these interconnection, interconnected passive present premises and comments. That the human condition determined by the nature of man and the nature of things was given once and for all. That the human good on that basis was really determinable and that the range of human actions and therefore responsibility was narrow, narrowly circumscribed. But now what we're doing, he goes on and says, we're expanding the artificial environment so these fixed parameters are no longer there. By the way, none of these people are saying that these things are necessarily wrong. What they're doing is pointing out where the problems arise when we try and do certain things that often come under the heading of playing God or um, anything with nature. Like the Chinese twins case, I probably don't really need to say much more about this because we talked about it quite a bit this morning and I gather we'll be talking about it again. We're all familiar with the example. Um, just one of the reports in one of the papers at home said any attempt to directly transform human embryos and produce babies has massive risks. And we've talked about some of those already and um, how we, or the fact that we might know how to handle them. Now, of course, everything has risks, and that's been brought up today before, but some risks are worse than others. And the argument with the plain God and nature thing is that um, we don't really know, um, or that the risks are so great. Well, they might be, and we are just ignorant at this stage. Robert Sparrow, he's um, a bioethicist at Monash, who um, you were talking about earlier on. Uh, the more we learn about genetics, the more complicated the interaction between genes and the environment here. It is one thing to be able to cut and paste DNA, but it is another to know what the result will be especially because modifications to one part of the genome can have unexpected effects elsewhere. It goes on the renewed debate about germline genetic engineering is nothing less than a debate about what it will mean to be human in the future. Will our grandchildren be born all equally, which is a genetic lottery, or will they be made stronger, better perhaps, children of the wealthy more so than others? They're created by designers and so are vulnerable to obsolescence. Okay, so you create kids with certain characteristics you think will be wanted in 20 years' time. Things change. So you think, oh, I better have some more babies and give them different modifications because these kids aren't actually good enough anymore. Um, now these things, it sounds silly probably, but these things, if um, the technology developed and was used in that way would all be decisions we have to start thinking about. Okay, so what's wrong with playing God? It's dangerous, we don't know what the consequences will be. It's not dangerous just because um, we know there are risks. 
it's dangerous because in a lot of cases we don't actually know what the risks are and we don't know what we would do about them anyway. An underlying thought here is it's okay for God because he knows everything but we don't so we can't predict consequences. You can't really, you can't actually carry this one over into nature so well. But, um, we're entering new territory. Qualitative differences, it's not just a matter of doing things that are slightly different. It's doing things that are qualitatively different. Well, not 100% sure of that, but if they're qualitatively different, they're very different. Okay, we're creating or modifying life, and life in the past, at least human life, was um, really a matter of, of chance. I mean, apart from things like education, but actually creating the, the human was, was chance. Human enhancement. Uh, and as I said, we could also be talking about human disenhancement. There's a book, a well, another well-known novel in English. Um, I think it's 1984. I get them, there's a couple of books I get mixed up. Jordan or Brave New World, but one of the two. Yeah. Um, where they breed people. Um, there are basically four classes of people and they breed them to do certain jobs. Right now, it's not genetic engineering. This was written in the 30s, I think. Um, but they, they've got breeding down to a fine art. So you have all these people, the lower class people, to do the dirty jobs, you know, intelligentsia to do the clever, the hard, the intellectual jobs, and so on, and a few classes in between. Now, if we did genetic engineer, if um, this sort of gene technology developed, it wouldn't really be too hard to um, create people to do all of the jobs we don't like. In fact, there was one getting on to the environmental issue and climate change. An article came out a few years ago, I can't remember the authors. One was Rebecca Roach, I can't remember who the other one was. Um, the paper came out of Oxford, arguing in favour of um, genetically engineering people to be smaller so, so that we don't have, they don't create as much um, they don't have such a big footprint on the face of the earth that they consume less. Now you can imagine if climate change gets really bad, and there's a good chance that it will, that one way of, of solving the problem would be to create people who don't actually um, use very much food, don't use many resources and so on. Now that sounds pretty awful, that sounds pretty far-fetched. But it's only the other sort of side of human enhancement which people are talking about a lot these days. So these are all interesting questions that are coming up. Of the that quantitative change at the bottom. New parameters, we have to make new decisions. System issues, um, where one issue will, or one solution will cause problems elsewhere. And we get out of our depth, we don't know what to do. One of the things I was thinking about this morning too, when we were talking about how about health and how important it is and leading better quality lives and for a lot longer, that's good and all of us want to stay healthy for as long as we possibly can. But the other side of that coin is that we're not going to stay healthy very long if there are too many of us and we run out of food and run out of water and run out of all sorts of resources. So if you want to have a healthy population, along with health, I mean medicine, that sort of thing, has to be research on the environment, has to be research on food production. That came up this morning. So we have to, if we start modifying um, or doing fairly big things to people, we have to start looking at the total picture and not just one aspect of it. Because um, 
the earth as a system or more than the earth, but at least the earth as a system, right? And changes in one part affect changes in another. And we can very easily get out of our depth. Okay, now getting back to poor old Frankenstein and the monster he created. People often get the wrong impression and think that this creature that Frankenstein created was a monster from the start. But he wasn't. He was actually quite kind and wanted to be friends with people. But because he looked so horrible, everybody was scared of him. Right? So the big problem with Frankenstein's monster wasn't the monster or wasn't the creation itself. It was the fact that Frankenstein didn't think of all of the possibilities carefully enough and realised that anything that humanish likes to have friends and wants to have company and so on. And this is a good example, I think, of doing something which you think might be really exciting to do and a nice intellectual challenge, but not bothering to think about, to think about consequences. I think the Frankenstein example is a good one in that for raising the issue about um, worrying about the consequences of what we do. Okay, the, the, the um, nasty consequences were that the monster killed lots of people and did lots of nasty things. But the reason he became a monster was not because of his creation, it was the fact that he wanted friends and Frankenstein hadn't um, given that any thought. In the literature there's quite a lot on, on forbidden knowledge. Are there things we shouldn't do? I won't get uh, too much into that. Frankenstein's knowledge. Frankenstein must have known that people wanted friends because we, most of us do, but he didn't give any thought to uh, Frankenstein to the monster, to his creation. The real Frankenstein problem, not so much he created the monster, he was not careful enough, he should have thought more about friendship and companionship. So now back to playing God and what is the problem? Playing God or interfering with nature, I want to say, can be more than just a rhetorical device to say that you shouldn't do something. It can point so entering into the unknown where extra care has to be taken, where the old parameters to do with choice and chance and so on don't apply. <coughs> Perhaps where there's large scale intermeshing and we can't really understand it. Uh, where changes, and this is the genetic engineering thing in particular, could cross generations. Um, and that I think is a serious issue in obviously the germ line. Um, where changes are on a global scale. And remember Frankenstein's monster, what Frankenstein didn't think about that caused a big problem. Now there's one other um, issue that I think needs to be raised and that is that this way of looking at the playing God problem or not interfering with nature problem, or interfering with nature problem, um, I think it has teeth. I think it's something we should worry about because of crossing boundaries and so on, the way that I've spelled it out. But I think it's relative to a time. Now, it could be um, that, you know, in 20 years' time, we do work out how to solve some of these problems. And I don't know, but what I'm saying is that the, the main prop point I'm trying to make is that these are problems in doing something now that may not be down the track if we take a lot of very small incremental steps for the next 20, 30, 40 years. We might get to the stage where we can do some of these things that would be dangerous to do now but then they mightn't be because we might have worked out what's going on and worked out how to solve the problems and so on. So I still think that um, it's something we should think very carefully about and we should remember Frankenstein's concept. 
Okay, thank you. That's it. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, John. Uh, Daniel is up immediately, and then Ryan, please. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, lecture, especially that uh, you reminded me of things that I wasn't thinking about for a long time, and you introduced new concept, and especially I'm thinking of the title, Playing God, because uh, you were mentioning Hans Jonas, who was born, by the way, in the same town, at the same city as my mother was born, Mirshin Gladbach. 28 years earlier, and uh, after World War II, he reconsidered theology, following Gnosticism, and science, and what we now term bioethics together, because he said there was something completely wrong in the ethics of science as manifested in World War II. Now, your title is saying playing God and not assuming the responsibilities of God. And playing is something without uh, responsibility. And the whole discussion, and you were talking about enhancing humans, the whole discussion presumes that uh, you were talking about God, humans, and nature. The whole discussion presumes that we know what we're talking by God, humans, and nature. Now I disagree with this, uh, not with you. I disagree with those who think that they know what these concepts are and therefore could play God. And I'll give you one example and therefore I have to stay. I want to show you something. I do things like that. Uh, that's playing with chi. And those who manipulate genes have no idea about such concepts. According to their concept of humans, it does not include chi or chakras or any concept derived from Taoism, Qigong, Yoga, or whatever. They think that they know what humans are, and humans are nothing but the creation of arbitrary uh, evolution. I'm not saying evolution. I agree that we are creation of evolution. But arbitrary evolution which explains, according to biologist Richard Dawkins, the phenomenon that most people have back pains. I don't have back pain. Because my body, through evolution, can deliver waves like this, either in slow motion or fast. So, they play God by assuming they know what humans are, by assuming they know what evolution is. They assume that evolution is primarily arbitrary changes in our genome for some reason, reason or another. I think there are too many presumptions that are used in order to ju justify an irresponsible science. Now, I'm using irresponsible science in an unprejudiced way. Uh, I'll explain. During my uh, participation in anti-fluoridation campaign, which is about to be concluded successful in Israel, has already prevented the Ministry of Health to renew water fluoridation. We discovered that the political, at the political level, were uh, were saying whatever the experts are saying, we approve. 
And the experts were saying that we make the recommendation, but the responsibility is on the political level. In this sense, it is irresponsible because you cannot put the responsibility anywhere. <coughs> That's my remark. And I, actually, I will just close it. That's why I think that Hans Jonas made a great con contribution which has not been properly acknowledged by looking at science from a theological point of view. Uh, looking at science and pointing at the theological presumptions within science. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Yeah, look, some of the things that um, you were talking about, I'll probably say a bit more about it in my talk on Friday or whenever it is, because I think there are some big issues um, with looking at the way science and technology is presented. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. But I also think that probably um, Hans Jonas gets a bit more coverage. He doesn't get a lot in the uh, English-speaking world, I agree. But there is a reasonable world outside of the English-speaking world too. Orion, please. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for the wonderful talk. I was wondering where is the place of freedom uh, in this uh, discussion? Um, when you decide, for instance, who lives and who dies, I think you are playing God. Um, a lot of the atrocities done in this world are a result of the abuse of power. And in that regard, it is also the abuse of freedom. So that when we say we are playing God, are we simply stating, for instance, that man has moral limits or perhaps man has intellectual limits and he has not yet uh, reached the height of that intellectual limits? If we talk about this evolutionary process, for instance, there are hierarchies and it is possible that if we compare man right now to man 2,000 years ago, they don't have not only the tools but also those sophisticated insights and the ability to imagine, which I suppose is also part of the evolutionary process. And I also believe that God uh, would also want us to advance because uh, while there are negative effects, for instance, there are also positive effects in terms of, say, for instance, if you have children who have this sort of genetic disabilities, I suppose they have nothing to lose if they rely on science because that, I think, is the most uh, effective means made available to man. And if there is a God, and should there be a God, I believe that the link between man and God can only be our mind so that uh, if science is the product of the human mind, then I suppose there is also something positive that suggests that our freedom somehow is able to transcend uh, these limits. Uh, that maybe we are afraid, but I suppose, maybe who knows, 10, 20, 30 years from now, we will be able to see the light of day in terms of looking for the, the solutions to these uh, genetic problems and, and diseases that we give a lot of human beings. Thanks. Yeah, look. I mean, I think, um, I mean, we do have the freedom to, to push boundaries and um, move on from areas um, that we are familiar with. Um, when we talk about getting out of our comfort, comfort zones, and I presume that um, scientists should be doing that as well, as well as technological developers and other people. Um, I don't think that takes away the responsibility of being very careful when we do that sort of thing, that we don't just do it because we think it's exciting and so on. Obviously, Frankenstein thought building a person was, create, was exciting, which perhaps it would be, um, although robbing graves doesn't sound all that exciting to me. But, um, I mean, it shouldn't be... When we do go beyond our comfort zones, we shouldn't do it just because it's exciting. We should do it. We should be very careful about what we do. Make sure that there's a good reason for doing it. 
um, and not just for our own self gratification. <coughs> yeah, um, I, I read Frankenstein and the reason was trivial, but I'm talking about uh, valid and justified issues, for instance, in terms of diseases that the scientists can, can push uh, the boundaries, uh, for instance, in terms of their capacities, so that we might be able to um, address these this issues uh, in the near future. Well, they certainly do. I mean, that's why um, they are looking at, um, or not only looking at, but doing research into gene editing in, in various areas. And I'm not going to say that they, they shouldn't be doing that. I remember giving a talk to was a scientific research place in, um, in Australia a few years ago and I called my talk, I don't care what you do so much as long as you worry about it. Because if the scientists worry about what they're doing, think carefully about what they're doing, I think they're going to be probably doing it a lot more carefully. It won't stop them doing certain things to try and fix problems, but it might give them second thoughts about doing something just because it's exciting. Yes, it was indeed a very excellent presentation that made me uh, uh, reflect. Um, so the key word to me in your presentation, I think, is uh, nature, going natural. And that uh, comes now to the question of um, um, gene modification uh, or going basic, going natural. You know, in the Philippines, uh, last December, I um, I um, I watch uh, um, I saw in the t television about uh, Dr. Tam Mateo. No? He's um, he's an alternative doc natural doctor. Uh, he's not a medical doctor, but he uh, was able to treat a lot of cancer patients, not uh, through gene modification, not uh, through uh, uh, Western medicines, but just uh, eating plain uh, natural food. But the problem is very difficult. No meat, no no fish, no dairy products. But a lot of patients now were able to, you know, treat be treated with cancer. Mm. So um, in your presentation, um, it, you provided the philosophy, no? philosophy behind the science and also behind nature, and uh, it was uh, presented uh, excellently and uh, made me also reflect uh, the, um, about. It really depends on. Uh, uh, from the point of view, from the point of view of a scientist, uh, they have a very good uh, reason behind their what they are doing. <coughs> from the point of view of the naturalists, from the point of view of religious, but uh, indeed, uh, um, it bo all boils down on the meaning of uh, uh, ethics, the bioethics. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure, thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much, John. Excellent.